Hello and welcome to the program. I am Ama Marcus. UK's Prime Minister Keir Starmer has begun his government with the tour of four nations. Mr. Starmer visited Northern Ireland and Wales to voice new promises and ambitions for the nation's leaders. Well, this comes after Labour won 34% of the national vote in the UK elections. However, questions remain, which are, has the electorate truly embraced the Labour Party or was this just a vote against the Conservatives? And with a third party on the rise, is the UK politics changing shape? Well, joining us this morning to help answer some of these questions from the University of Cambridge. He is, uh, he is aspiring to be a member of the union. He is Mr. Falakumi Finero. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to the show. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you for coming. So, Mr. Starmer has talked about the need to unify the country and has made promises to deliver change, uh, what, which, which the people are expecting. Now, how do you reckon he would be able to deliver on these promises? So, what, what's quite peculiar about the UK system is that there's no period like we have in Nigeria for inauguration um, and you obviously in Nigeria, the election happens in February and then the president doesn't actually start working until May um, after the inauguration or June, give or take. Um, but in the UK, they literally start working straight away. So the election happened on Thursday and he was in office on Friday morning. And so he had to meet with the king and he had to lay out his agenda and seek permission to form a government. And... I think what's been interesting is that the Labour Party have hit quite a few low-hanging fruits, should I say. Um, so they've announced that this week they'll begin discussions with the junior doctors. Um, so the junior doctors have been the last group within the NHS that have been striking and um, not accepting the government's demands as to the pay rises. I think um, they're uh, trying to negotiate to have a 35% increase in pay rises to match inflation and the increased cost of living. So West Streeting, who is the, the health minister in the Starmer government, will be meeting with them this week to hear their demands and to try and quickly get something on the table. Um, they've also quickly cancelled the Rwanda scheme that the Conservatives sort of hinged their entire legacy on. Uh, and so that's another another low-hanging fruit. Uh, and what what's also been quite interesting is to see the um, the the Chancellor of the UK now, um, uh, Rachel Reeves, uh, announced that they're trying to reform planning laws as a strategy for economic development, and you know this is quite interesting because obviously if you can accelerate housing, if you can use that as a way to build green infrastructure, if you can rewrite. The planning rules and and make it easier to to get things done from like a um, a building perspective. Obviously, that helps to accelerate the economy. But I think it'll be interesting to see how well they can do that quite quickly, um, because there'll be a lot of pushback. There's there's this notion of the the green belt in the UK, where there's this sort of romanticized idea of vast spreads of country land and, and like farmland that. People can just sort of like wander around in that, you know, really is this very nostalgic idea of Britain being a country that's mostly green um, and, and, you know, people have their massive townhouses and huge plots of land to play with. And that idea has sort of morphed into this actual government policy called the Green Belt that protects certain green areas of land that can't be built in. And the Labour plan is to sort of reduce some of this land and try and build there so that they can have more um, development in the country. Uh, so inevitably, there'll be a lot of local opposition to this. So it'd be interesting to see how they navigate that. Um, but of course, they have the quite a huge majority. So it'd be quite interesting to see how they'll use that to um, push through some of these policies. Mm. Um, and then on Palestine, which was quite a topical um, conversation in the UK uh, leading up to the election, even though it didn't quite make it into the debates that the um, leading parties had. Um, but what was quite interesting was that uh, already the UK government has called for a ceasefire and they've proposed a two-state solution. They supported a two-state solution in Israel and Palestine. And that's quite important for them to do, to be honest, because 
there were six independent party um, MPs that were sorry that were elected in this election, and they were all pretty much elected on a, a platform of being pro-Palestinian and almost as like a protest vote against the Labour Party. And in some of these cases, it's quite senior Labour Party officials actually lost their seats, and so it would be quite. It would have been quite unwise, should I say, for the Labour Party to come in and not at least cater to this dissenting voice within the um, traditional constituencies. And so you've seen that in the, like I mentioned, the ceasefire with the two-state solution as well, um, but then also the appointments as well. So the new Attorney General of the UK is a man called Richard Kerma Casey, um, and he was actually part of the eight Jewish lawyers that called on Israel to obey international law, which was quite unpopular at the time. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that continues for the for the Labour Party, whether they can um, continue with these like small, should I say low hanging fruits, because these are sort of pretty, pretty symbolic and relatively straightforward things that they could do. Um, the, the real challenge will be when they decide to start implementing this broader based industrial strategy which will inevitably take time they want the uk to become a clean energy superpower they want to um you know start exporting some of these the the, the things developed within the uk to their neighboring markets and, and across the world those kind of things will take time as as well as um, some of their plans on crime and safety um so i think long term we'll have to wait and see how well um, the Labour Party delivers, but I think as like f the first few days have gone, they've been quite successful in just picking up these low hanging fruits to give people a sense of, okay, there's adults in the room now making decisions, as opposed to the party politics that we saw the Conservative Party playing. Mm. Well, speaking of the Labour Party and some of the things it's doing, for the first time we're seeing a female being the finance minister. And of course, that is speaking in volumes. Well, speaking of volumes, she gave a speech and she repeatedly used secure economics. Now, what are the main economic challenges the new party leadership needs to address immediately? Yes. So just to unpack the, the word secure economics, so it's sort of to refer to the fact that the UK government will now focus on securing their own economic um, sa safety um, at the expense of sort of global expansion. Um, and it, it's sort of a, a trade-off between this notion of free enterprise versus economic safety at home. Um, free enterprise being that businesses can engage with whoever they want all across the world. And I think this is sort of a, a trend that we're seeing because it's very similar to Bidenomics that we've seen in the US. Um, and it's following the trend of, of Brexit, of COVID, the war in Ukraine. And in academic circles, it's, it's referred to as reshoring. So previously, businesses would offshore their production and supply chains across the world, wherever it's cheap, most cheapest to, to have it be done. But then as we're seeing with these um, trends that can, and, and these sort of uh, cases that can sort of shock supply chains like with COVID and the war in Ukraine, countries are now more eager to have their, um, their, their production be done internally. So to be a bit more self-sufficient and a bit more resilient to the global forces that may, may sway. And I think it's quite a smart move. I think it's definitely the trend that we're seeing across the world. Um, and I think it sort of links into something that the Conservative Party did. And I think this would be particularly interesting to see whether Labour goes on in the same vein. So the Conservative Party obviously had levelling up as their big agenda. So this was a post-Brexit thing where they were trying to speak about the different economic disparities within the country. So how there's been a disproportionate amount of development in the southern parts of the country, compared to the north which was typically the manufacturing and industrial um uh, power force of the country a and over time you've seen those jobs sort of be shipped across the world and the uk sort of came with this strategy sorry the, the conservative party came up with this strategy to level up all parts of the country at the same time and it'll be interesting to see how the labor government and the new chancellor rachel reeves sort of 
decide whether or not to key into this um, narrative that we need to level up all parts of the country. Um, so, yeah, that's one sort of, I guess that's leading into one economic challenge that they're facing, the economic disparities. Um, but, you know, like I mentioned last time, there's issues with productivity, um, an aging population. Um, there's issues with the UK industry being um, depleted by the forces of global competition. There's the cost of living crisis. There's a relationship with the EU. So I think there's a lot of things that the new chancellor will need to really dig into and to try and actually fix some aspects of the country. Um, and I think just just going back to the um, the economic disparities, I think it is really where they need to focus on because that that's sort of leading to the appeal of the far right, which is winning seats or, or has won um, you know, over a huge sway of the electorate by this incessant need to focus on, um, or this rather this fixation on domestic issues and very local issues. Um, they need to sort of, the, the, the Labour Party needs to sort of focus more on the, um, the, the, the leveling up approach because they, um, otherwise they, they would sort of lose these people that have already shown that they're willing to vote for parties like reform um and and, and they can then um um actually now win them back and regain their trust mm. well you just mentioned trust and let's look at public trust for a moment now what trends are you observing in the public towards politicians and we of course and now there's a change in politics at the moment but what trends are you observing in in the public on you know public trust towards politicians and political institutions so I think it's a bit too soon to say whether people trust the Labour government more than the previous Conservative governments, whether there's been an increase in the levels of trust. Um, but I think one thing that people can see is that the Conservative governments were certainly playing politics more than putting the country first. And this is something that Keir Starmer really focused on. Um, he really tried to emphasise that he puts the country first over the party. And this was even shown by kicking out or isolating established figures within the Labour Party, like Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott, and sort of saying that, look, these people represent an idea that might be good for the party. And, and you know, they, they have clear connections and they have clear roots in the party, but ultimately some of the ideas are not beneficial for the country at large. Um, and I think that message really resonated with the voters in the UK, which obviously is why they were able to win the election. Um, but like I said, it's still too soon to say whether this trust in the government is great, something that will hold water long term. Um, but as we've seen, like I mentioned earlier, there's been low-hanging fruits that they picked on that I think will help to you know, give the UK public a sense that, okay, look, there's actually adults in the room now. But ultimately, they really need to deliver long term. And that's sort of what I was getting at before with the um, leveling up approach and making sure that they deal with the economic disparities in the country. Um, the far right is, is on their neck. You know, there's a lot of seats that the, the Reform Party came second or third in. And so I think we need to really see, in order to build trust, um, we need to see the Labour Party actually deliver long term. And this isn't really a thing for the UK government in particular. I mean, in Nigeria, it's the same thing. In Kenya, it's the same thing. I think politicians across the world are facing a trust deficit. People are becoming increasingly disillusioned with the political system and its ability to actually bring about change in, in their country. And I think, um, you know, the only way you can overcome that trust deficit is by actually delivering and actually improving the lives of your people and then also being able to um communicate that to people across the country and i think that's kind of the problem we're seeing with in the us that the um biden has improved the us economy you know th they brought down inflation they've reduced unemployment um and the economy has grown since co since covid sorry and but then they're having a problem of communicating that to people and part of that is to to Biden's age. So I think 
the UK government can really learn from a lot of these examples across the world in terms of how to build back trust, but then also how to communicate that to the electorate so that they can win seats at the next election. Mm. Well, we're seeing these new changes. Of course, you touched a little bit on the Rwanda plan, which has been dropped, and you mentioned some low hanging fruits. Now, these changes, how are they being perceived internationally? You know, following these recent developments, is this a good thing for Britain at this time, or is it something you think should have waited a bit longer? So, I think these are changes that are being generally well received. Um, I think the UK government um, under the Conservative Party sort of was catering more to the the far right elements of the population and almost as a way to try and react in, in a reactive way, try and just win votes and just try and get into um, into and stay in power, get into staying power. And I, I was reading um, Barack Obama's memoir last year and i noticed there was a point he mentioned about how um whenever he had to make a decision it was always about figuring out the right answer first and then working at the politics next not making a decision instead of making a decision based on the politics and what the politics allows as the easiest option and then using that to determine your policy and i think that's the trap that the conservative party fell into with things like the rwanda scheme Th there's no serious uh, legal or political commentator who said that the Rwanda scheme was a good idea and it, it sort of was almost about to turn the UK into a, a, a global prior state because they were even willing to leave the European Convention on Human Rights to you know pass their own Human Rights Act and allow for this sort of scheme to take place and so I think by scrapping it it sort of shows that there are some sensibilities still remaining in the UK um, it shows that the UK has been able to listen to its moral core because people like the the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's the almost seen as the the moral uh, guide of the in the UK, um, also spoke quite strongly against the um, Rwanda policy. And so, it's the the fact that it's been now cancelled shows that the UK government is sort of listening to that and also just sort of doing what is actually best for the country and, and in response it's not just a, i mean because there is a problem with um illegal migration coming into the country um it's not just about cancelling it but they've also now put in place their own plan to have a secure border force so it'd be interesting to see how that actually works in practice now mm. now let's look at international relationship with key allies uh you know Yesterday, Keir Starmer dispatched his, I think it was his secretary on foreign affairs to Ukraine, of course, to secure ties. Now, would these UK relationships that have been bonded over time, would they be affected in any way due to policies or government changes or government structures? You know, is this a welcome development on the international scene for the UK? I think it is. I think it is because the, of course, the, the economic strategy of the Labour government is to focus more on domestic issues, but the, in terms of the foreign policy as uh, in, that the Labour government has campaigned and won on is more working with the is more about working with the global population, and you know I think you know we'll see what happens today at the there's a NATO summit happening yeah. today in Washington DC, mm. um, and that will be a good opportunity for. Keir Starmer to speak with a lot of the leaders of the um, the NATO community and to sort of almost look the part of a uh, a prime minister and to speak on behalf of the UK's interests and continue this vision where he that he won on where, where he can show that the UK is ready to play with the, the rest of the world but that, that doesn't represent a fundamental shift from the policies and the, the actions taken by Rishi Sunak. Um, but I think what might be interesting to see is, you know, how the, the, the Labour government wants to work with the EU. Obviously, the Conservative Party were the party who brought in Brexit and were sort of beholden to ensure that Brexit worked, whether that have positively or negatively affected the economy of the country. Um, but then you're seeing with Labour that 
they have an industrial strategy to provide and produce more goods in the UK and to make this the UK this clean energy superpower. Well, that can only really be successful if you're integrating more with the EU and if you're you know allowing your services and your goods to go across to the EU. So something like a, a single market, uh, sorry, the, entering the customs union would be quite interesting to see. But again, the Labour Party haven't really campaigned on that quite explicitly. I guess that might be part of this broader strategy by Labour to provide a, a centrist alternative and not try and alienate too many voters. So I think it'll be interesting to see whether now that they're in power, they try and integrate more with the EU. Um, but then the world is also changing quite rapidly. And, you know, the, in the US, there's Donald Trump's um, likely chance of getting elected. Um, there's an increasingly rightward shift in Europe. And so I think how Keir Starmer and the Labour government decides to, to work with or not work with the rest of the world, particularly given the fact that there's so many ideological differences um, between them and someone like Donald Trump, for example, or someone like Marine Le Pen, um, it will be interesting to see how they decide to work with them or not. Mm. Mr. Pinero, it's been a pleasure having you to give us those updates and, of course, the effect this government is having. We're just excited. Seems like the interesting times in the UK. And, of course, we hope to have you soon on the program. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. Okay.